Good morning, all. Good to see your cheerful faces here. <laughs> I just wanted to start firstly by um, acknowledging how important life groups are. Um, we do a families of faith, and I know there's several other life groups, and that has been so significant in our lives and our Christian walk with God. Um, and it, it's impacted me to the point where I'm actually at here sharing this morning. Um, I'll start off by this. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can have what you ask in my name and it will be done so that my Father in heaven may be glorified. Um, I've seen that in Sam. He's abiding in Christ. Um, he's abiding in his love. And his love's abiding in him. And he's asked for several things this year, or last year, sorry. And they've happened. He's got a dog. He's got a computer. He's got um, a game console. And God gets the glory for all of that. Um, and the same in our lives. Um, my title here is God's New Covenant is Established on His Love. Um, when you think about righteousness, self-righteousness is established on pride. I can do this my way. Um, I'm right. You've wronged me. I'm entitled to get angry. I can take offence because you did the wrong thing by me. But when we go by God's love, his, his new covenant established on love, we go, I walk in forgiveness. Um, God's forgiven me freely. I've wronged it says, if I, wrongs, if I even think something in my heart wrongly towards my brother, that's as good as doing it. I've committed that sin because I've thought it in my heart. So none of us are righteous. So if we think that we are, we're deceiving ourselves. When we're walking in God's righteousness, we walk in forgiveness. I, I was thinking 1 uh, Corinthians 13 talks about what love is. Um, I'm not really following my notes properly here. <laughs> so 1 Corinthians 13 talks about what love is. Tidy. There it is, last page. If I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love for others, growing out of God's love for me, then I have become only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, just an annoying distraction. And if I have the gift of prophecy and speak a new message from God to the people and understand all the mysteries and possess all knowledge, and if I have all sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains but do not have love reaching out to others, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it does me no good at all. Love endures with patience. And serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful. It is not jealous or envious. Love does not brag and it is not proud or arrogant. It is not rude. It is not self seeking. It is not provoked nor overly sensitive or easily angered. It does not take into account a wrong endured. It does not take into account a wrong endured. It does not rejoice at injustice, but rejoices with truth when right and truth prevail. Love bears all things, regardless of what comes. It believes all things, looking for the best in each other. Hopes all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times. It endures all things without weakening. Then it goes on to say, love never fails. It never fades, nor does it end. But as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for the gift of knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, for our knowledge is fragmented and incomplete. But when that which is complete and perfect comes, that which is incomplete and partial will pass away. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now, in this time of imperfection, we see in a mirror dimly a blurred reflection, a riddle of an enigma. But then, when the time of perfection comes, 
we will see re reality face to face. Now I know in part, just in fragments, but then I will fully, I will know fully, just as I have been fully known by God. And now there remains faith, abiding trust in God and his promises, hope, confident expectation of eternal salvation, love, unselfish, love for others, growing out of God's love for me. These three, the choicest graces, but the greatest of these is love. That's the greatest gift God's given us. And we're to follow that. We're to, as Christ laid down his life for us, we're to lay down our lives for the church. When, when we think about... Um, I, I was reminiscing on my way here this morning with Kirsty about um, a love I had for surfing. And I didn't realise it at the time. We were, first, we were newly married and I'd put surfing first. I thought it was my ministry. I was involved in Christian surfers and, I, uh, and one day I took the television and the video recorder so that I could, we were doing a surfing pro-am outreach and, and the car, we only had one car between us. And I thought, wow, I'm, I'm really doing something great for the kingdom here and I've left Kirsty at home with nothing. And then I've come home and she's left a lovely note that was written in love <laughs> telling me how she'd felt. And I realised that I'd made surfing a priority over her. So I gave up surfing. Um, I gave it up indefinitely, but she said after a year that I'd proved that I, she was first in my life. Well, God ultimately and then her. But it was a sacrifice like um, that I was willing to make. And it's not... Anything in comparison to what God's done for us, but it's these little things that we do that show our love for each other. Um, and Kirsty was sharing with me um, this this guy. I don't know if I can say his name or not. A guy that used to go to our old church years and years ago when we were teenagers. And before he got saved, his wife got saved, and he didn't want a bar of it. And he thought he'd go to the pub after work and have a drink. Yeah, you know, just have a drink. And he realised he was going to be a bit late and he's thinking, oh, I'm going to come home and I'm going to get into trouble, a little bit of trouble. So I might as well enjoy myself and stay here and, <laughs> you know, get into real trouble, but enjoy myself. <laughs> so he came home ready for a fight, thinking, you know, it's going to be on. And she was a new Christian and she'd gotten a hold of God's love and compassion. And... As he walked through the door, she's like, oh, I didn't know what time you'd be home. Would you like me to heat your dinner up for you? He was greeted with love and compassion and he just melted. And that's the power of God's love. And when we think about our communities and how we respond to people, I mean, I drive a truck for a living and God's been dealing with me with love. And, you know, I, I was a little bit self-righteous. I thought, oh, I've got this nailed. <laughs> and I'm um, coming home and I... I I had a lot of prayer here. Thank you all, all by the way, for your prayers um, because it was amazing. I felt those prayers. I had no drowsiness. I was driving 12 to 15 hours a day and I was so alert the whole time. It was amazing until I got to Melbourne. Drivers in Melbourne are a little bit worse than South Australia and Western Australia. So I got to Melbourne and suddenly people are aggravating me, pulling in front of me, they're slowing down and I'm getting upset. And I was thinking... I've been preaching this to myself in the truck and to God. And I was like, wow, I didn't realise I had these issues still. Um, and I, re I was reminded by Bill and Ginger Horn, um, Kenneth Copeland, such a humble man. He prays that he asks or he says he forgives people before he even goes out. Um, he's in a state of forgiveness. And you think, oh, how do you do that? And then I realised when I was driving that truck, I've got two ways of behaving. I can behave in a self-righteous manner and go, well, you shouldn't have done that and, you know, um, aggravate the situation and maybe, you know, cause an accident later on. Um, or I can be in God's, like, you know, God's love, his com compassion and his grace and show that, let that outwork itself in that situation and maybe change that whole dilemma um because i don't know what that guy's going through that's driving um that's just you know 
overtake me in a reckless way and then slammed on his brakes or whatever they might be doing. Um, it's the small foxes that sort of destroy the vine. And when we let little offences in, that's what does the damage. And you get resentful. And then you're out of the love and you're out of that covenant. Um, it was established on love and we're to walk in love. And when we let that overtake us, when we let that live itself out in us, um, I, was, I, was just, I was just thinking of Sam. Um, he, uh, he's an amazing child, my, my son. Uh, I know I'm biased, but... I think he is anyway, even if, even if I wasn't biased. Um, we, we were horsing around last year in the pool and I'd heard, I'd, I'd get a bit competitive sometimes, as Josh knows. <laughs> and we were, play, we were playing a game in the pool and I accidentally hurt Sam and I was so upset with myself, wasn't I? And I, I, um, I was upset with myself and I was having a bit of a pity party really. And Sam's come up to me and he goes, I forgive you, Dad. It's okay. And I'm like, no, nah, it's not, not okay, mate. I shouldn't have done that. That's not on. And he goes, Dad, you've taken Jesus off the cross and you put yourself there. You, you need to let Jesus. And I thought, wow. You know, that's compassion outworking in Sam where he's having compassion on me. Um, you know, revival starts in the heart. And when we learn to love and have compassion on each other, and like what First uh, Corinthians 13 talks about, um, you know, love doesn't notice when others do it wrong. Um, you know, I'm thinking of reflecting on Sam again. When he was a child and we were trying to teach him things, um, we didn't go, ah, no, that's not how you, that's not how you um, play chess, Sam. You, know, that, that, you shouldn't move your pawn there first. Um, we let him do it because... We love him and we encourage him, we edify him, we, we build him up. Um, but we don't nitpick, we don't criticise. We uh, Even to the point where I grew up and my parents or my father used to hate the way I ate, where I got so conscientious about the noises I used to make. And as a result, I think that ended up being imparted into me somehow where I can hear people eat and I hear these noises too. <laughs> and I think, ah, oh. well, God's done a work in me where I can have Sam eating right next to my ear <laughs> and it doesn't bother me anymore. Um, it's, when, when you've got that love that's out working in you, but you've got to abide in Christ, abide, live in his word, abide in his love. That's when his, his word abides in you. And his love abides in you. I mean, I was in the truck and I wasn't talking to myself. I was talking to God. And I was talking about his word and it was just coming up. Because I've been, I've been um, living in it. I've been abiding in it. And <clears throat> life group, that was sort of the beginning of that process. We didn't realise how important it is to get yourself regimented, where you put the word before your eyes in the morning and you put your eyes, put the word before your eyes at night before you get to sleep and all day you think on it, on and off and all night. I even dream about it sometimes and you wake up and you have revelation when you wake up and you go, I know what that means. Oh, when you understand God's heart and his love and you start to read, because I had a father that was a little bit um, judgmental. So my that coloured my thing of what God was. And I guess my father was very sarcastic. And when I read the Bible, I think I read it with that tainting it a little bit. And as you get to know God's love and you understand God's love and you go, oh, he doesn't mean it like that. He means it from a place of love. He means it from a place of compassion. I mean, there's a scripture that says Jesus was moved with compassion and he healed them all. Um, you know, love doesn't want you to live in sickness. It doesn't want you to live in, in um, pain or poverty 
Love wants you to have the best. I mean, I want the best for my son. God wants the best for us. We're his children. Uh, we, we just need to get a revelation of that love so deep on the inside of us. And the only way that comes is by abiding in his word. Um, life groups have been the lifeline to us. And it's caused us to get regimented into his words so much. And we're seeing breakthroughs all the time now. Kirsty was saying to me today, there was a survey of people that read the Bible once a week, twice a week, three times a week and more. The ones that read it once, twice or three times a week, nothing significantly really happened in their lives. The ones that read it three times or more a week, they, they started to see life-changing things happen in their lives. Mental um, issues resolved. Um, anxiety's gone. Yeah, massive breakthroughs in, in their lives. Um, I cannot stress enough how much, how important it is to abide in his word, abide in his love, and let that outwork come. Perfect love casts out all fear. Um, if there's any fear... It hasn't perfected itself yet. So you, you need to let that just, I think Pastor Peter was using the word, what, what, what do we call it when we soak meat overnight? Marinate. You've got to marinate in his word. Let it marinate in your lives. And, um, and you'll see an outworking, guaranteed. Um, yeah, just on that, do we want to do communion now? Yep. Um, we're going to have everybody come out the front for communion this morning. Um, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, if you have anything against your brother, um, to make it right. Um, I'll just read John 13, 34, actually. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, so that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. Um, I mean, Jesus paid the perfect sacrifice for us. He, he lived, he came down, humbled himself, he was born a child, he lived a life perfect before God, not out of pride or arrogance, but out of love. Um, he proved that it could be done. And then he made that ultimate sacrifice for us, laying down his life. He was tormented. He was bruised. He was shamed. Um, he was tormented on a cross. His body was broken. It was bruised. Um, so that means that he bled on the outside. He bled on the inside. Um he took our shame. Um, he took it all. So if we're not going to stand on God's promise for healing, according to Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement for his peace is upon us. And by his stripes we're healed. That's God's promise. If we were healed, we are healed. If we are healed, I am healed. So let's, let's honour God by standing on his word this morning, when we take this, remembering what he's done and declaring we are healed, we are whole, nothing missing, nothing is broken. So I'll just encourage everyone to come out the front, take their um, cordial and cracker back with them and... Praise you, Lord. I'll just read this while you're doing this. Ephesians 4, 32 to 33. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, perpetual animosity, resentment, strife, fault finding and slander be put away from you, along with every kind of malice or all spitefulness, verbal abuse, malevolence. Be kind and helpful to one another, tender hearted, 
compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely, just as God in Christ also forgave you. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can come before you this morning and just honour you by remembering what Christ did for us. Not only did he die for our sickness and our sins, but he restored us to you, Father God. We went from being your creation to being your sons and daughters. We've been restored into communion with you, Father God. We get to speak to you. We know that you hear us when we come before you. So we stand before you, Father God, acknowledging what Jesus did for us. And as we take this, we say we are healed we are whole and we are restored to you in Jesus' name. Your word says, anyone who calls on me will be saved. We call on you, Jesus. We thank you for your salvation. We thank you for your healing. Let's eat and drink now and rejoice for what God has done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.